Hello, I am Dr. Abstract and welcome back to Zim Explore. In this Zim Explore, we're going to take a look at a kind of a neat app that we made that was fairly successful on CodePen. So let's go there now. How's that for a slow, nice explore beginning? Yeah? I wonder if that's what uh, this explorer is going to be like. So we're on the Zim site now at zimjs.com. If I hit gold right here, we'll zoop down to the gold bars at the bottom. Along with that, uh, I think we can find a code pen link somewhere. You see something that looks like code pen? How do I usually get there? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Right there. Nice. And here we are in code pen. This is, uh, these are some code pens here. It looks like, yeah, we got one right here. The ring maze, that's what I want to look at. Now it's been put there with 49 likes. Nice, we've just launched the new code pen template too, so you can give that a heart along the way if you're part of code pen. It's good to sign up to code pen and you can make things. And welcome to follow us at Zim. And this is the ring maze, whoa. This is what we're going to explore today, is this 3D maze. What do you think of that? Can you do it? Did you try? All right, so we hit play. And at that point, ah, oh, this thing followed. That looks like a dead end that way. Oh, we have to come, oh, not back that way, back down here. Yeah, okay. And then up and over. Oh, go across the top. Isn't that nice? So this is a combination, uh, well it's all Zim, but uh, there's there's a bit of 3JS in here as well. There's also Zim Physics, so Zim Physics is doing the maze. I'm not sure if we've done an explore on the maze before. I don't know if we're going to get the whole way around, what do you think? I can talk a little bit about it as I go here, huh? You're probably wanting to go to this place, so uh, codepen.io, and then get yourself signed up and find ZimJS. That would be nice. Hmm, I think I can just sneak right along here along the bottom, but probably have to go back up here. This is a maze I printed at a maze generator, but we've done one before with just a hand-drawn maze in physics. So that's been around for a while in Zim. You may have seen that one before. Uh, it was a, a little hand-drawn maze that I drew, and then it was something like this where the physics ball now what we're doing is we're actually as we approach a wall we uh, take a look at the color of what's next to us or uh, these spots like a grid we sort of do a little grid around the circle and if it's a dark color then we put a physics wall there which way should i go i have to go back here and we put a physics wall there. So uh, you can turn the debug mode of physics on and see all these little little walls appear here all of a sudden. And that's what means, that's why I can't get through there. Um, so anyway, we're, I don't really want to explore too much on how we did the physics thing, although we can certainly look at that. Uh, but it's also using Zim Texture Active. We're about to hit the end here. You ready? Oh, and we did a little hit test and it says, congratulations. And then we're back at it again, the ring maze. What I wanted to show you or talk a bit about as well, but we've done explores on those, is the texture active. So we're putting this maze on a cylinder in 3JS and then rotating that cylinder. We've also got the ring maze on there and this Zim logo on it, another one. Probably could have stuck the whole thing on one. Can't remember if the T key works here. No, it doesn't. All right, so let's scroll this over and see what we've got going on. So we're importing Zim. Guess if it, uh, can we make the font bigger? Control plus plus maybe. Oh, it's probably big enough to look at. Okay, so we are bringing in Zim 3 from the Zim 016. And we also want to bring in physics. And when we do that, we want to call that something else. And we're just calling it Fizz. Or we don't even really use these namespaces anyway, um, because 
by default when we bring in from the CDN we have globals and we don't need to put zim.frame and zim.texture active. So you can set it up so that you require that. Uh, to do that you have to set ZNS for zim namespace equal to true before you import zim. So I'm not even sure. I guess you could probably do it. I think you have to make a new script tag to do that. Or you can use uh, Node Package Manager. And Node Package Manager has the those globals turned off by by default. And you'd have to simplify to turn that on. But we've done the other explorers on how to use Node Package Manager as well. So let's just get back to this one. We're bringing in the three three JS version of Zim and the physics. We're making it nice and long and not very high, and so that's basically this whole maze is 3,000 3, across. And then we're wrapping that 3,000 by 500. We're wrapping it around the texture of a cylinder on the inside of the cylinder. We brought in a PNG, and we have where that came from in here. We should have, I think it's probably in the message here. Comments. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I put that somewhere. Maybe as we went to do the maze. I had a link to where, what we used to make the maze. But uh, maybe we'll see it cylinder wall maze. Ah, right. Okay, here's, yeah, there we go. Okay. Thanks to the maze generator.net. And that's the picture of the maze. Here's a Google font, which is this fascinate in, and that's going to make the ring maze up there, that font right there. So that's handy to be able to bring in a Google font. And that's how we do it, the little shortcut now, since the latest version of Zim, GF for Google font. And then you put the name of the font here, and then you can start using that font down below. Our assets are located on CodePen. If you don't pay for CodePen, you don't get to store assets. I think you might be able to just point to our asset if you were forking this, for instance, with the little fork thing down here. You're always welcome to pay 60 bucks a year to pay for CodePen. I think it's worth it. Uh, it supports CodePen, which is a really good community for front-end developers. And it gives you some um, space on CodePen for assets and some other things. It lets you make private pens. And I guess that's probably about it. But still, like I said, it's good to support CodePen. All right. Uh, what now? Message, texture active to show title and button. Uh, right. So we had a start. I don't know if you remember that. Should I run, hit run on this again? Uh, this play button and that message. So that's a texture active up there. I don't know why we did that. It's slightly on a different, I don't, I don't even think you can really tell. It's slightly on a different curve, these things. Or we experimented with that, like we brought it out front a little bit and experimented a bit. And in the end, we almost made it exactly the same as on the, on the cylinder. So we probably could have just uh, done the cylinder there or with one texture active. Anyway, there's our new texture active, 400 by 90. And I think at some point what happens with phys physics and texture active is tricky uh, because your physics needs to be top left corner of the stage. So zero, zero on the stage. So if we're putting a bunch of texture actives, we have to make sure that they get, the texture actives are going to be distributed a, across the uh, Zim frame. So here's the frame right here. So the texture actives will uh, be made within this and you have to make sure that the physics is made first. That's why we bring in when we make the texture active that holds the physics that's the made with. So that's the Zim icon down at the bottom. That's the texture active for that. 
and then here's the cylinder which we call the wall so that's the the wall texture active come back to texture actives in a bit I just wanted to show you before we forget that when we make the texture actives down below here in 3JS side the texture actives we're putting the wall first so that the physics is on the very left did we turn off the manager toggle key T to remove? Oh, maybe we just don't have a T because it's code pen in it. Yeah, it might be we don't have the T because it's um, we, we, we're not receiving the keyboard um, in code pen and the iframe of the code pen. So that might be it. But usually you can press the letter T and then you can see the layout of all the texture actives. Uh, we could probably get in there some other way if we really needed to and you would then turn that off if you didn't want that then you set the toggle key to negative one and that's how you can stop people from hitting the T key and, and most people don't even know it but if you've got somewhere where you're typing obviously that <laughs> can be a problem typing away I hit the letter T and all of a sudden I toggle into uh, the Zim mode if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, which you probably don't, let me just demonstrate that. So we'll open up the texture active. You know, here's some more texture actives here where we can actually try out that T key, hmm, which might be a good one to do it on. That's only got one thing on it. Sometimes it helps to have multiple texture actives. Okay, let's try this one. So this has a texture active up here, the texture actives along here, texture actives on the sides. And if we T key, here they are. So there's the texture active that made the HUD top. There's these other texture actives. There's the texture active that is out. Uh, there's two of them there. There's the second one starts there. Okay, so you can use this thing to see the texture actives that are around in two dimensions and then close this or hit the T key again and it toggles back. And that's live. So note if we put the two texture actives here at the bottom and I hit the T key like that and look over here. There it is there. And there it is there. If I now move it to the end, there it just slid over to the end. Let's put the other one part way in like that. Hit the T key again. This one's at the end and that way's part part way in. So they're live. Um, I can increase the speed like so. Hit the T key. We come back, the speed is increased. So if I go halfway, hit the T key, it's halfway. If I go no speed, hit the T key, it's at no speed. All right, so texture actives are hooked up that way. Basically what is mapped onto here is what you see here. This Zim stuff is mapped on there. So that would be happening as well in the example that we've got going on here. All right, back on up. Uh, it's always nice to be in a Zim Explorer, isn't it? Where we get to explore all these things that we're making in Zim. Yeah. <laughs> Little reminder, if it feels like ever we're bouncing around from one place to another. Of course, we want to keep you listening, and, and hopefully we can do that. So the message texture active is up here. We've got a label, and note that we're using that Google font called fascinate in line and when we declare the Google font up here we put a plus sign in there that's how Google does it but when we use it we could put it if we wanted to but we don't need to and pink and that's what's getting that ring maze being up there that adds a lot by the way it doesn't take much to go take a look at Google fonts but if we did that with just our normal font that we're using for other things the logo doesn't seem quite as exciting it only takes five, 10 minutes to pick a font and try and pick the right one. So there's our button and we're positioning it. Oh, on this texture active. So this texture active is 400 by 90. If we went red, what would it look like? So I hit save on that. I'm gonna run the pen again. Okay, so that's uh, what we've made there, as well as we'll see later, but that's the 400. It's on a curve, but we've curved it. It's, it's not the cylinder, but it's actually a panel, and we've curved that. 
So that's 400 by 90. The one is positioned at the top there in the center, and the other one's positioned at the bottom in the center. And it doesn't quite go up to the center of that font just because um, uh, fonts have different fonts sort of fill the label in different ways. So here we go. If we want, we can play around with the offset. So that would be shift shift uh, V for shift vertical and shift H for shift horizontal. And then we could shift that around. That's a, a parameter of this label, which allows us to shift the resulting text within the container of the label. Anyway, we remove the button. And why do we remove the button? Oh, that's when we tap it. So once we've tapped it, we call this function. And we remove it. And we set a timeout and then turn the ball dynamic to true. So we've got this ball. That's this little ball right here. Right now it's static. That's why it stays there. As soon as we change it to dynamic true, we're going to see why in the physics it starts following the mouse because we've set that up uh, to do that. So uh, right now we haven't tapped on the play, but as soon as I tap on it, it waits one second and then it starts to try and follow the mouse, which is an interesting thing because if I'm on, let's see how to demonstrate this. I guess I'm gonna move it a little bit. Here we go. If I'm on the other side, look, it went the wrong way. If I'm on this side, it, follow, it comes towards my mouse. If I'm on this side, it goes the other way. That's because we've got this Zim, the, the Zim physics goes all the way around and comes back on the other side. So when my mouse is on the other side, it's actually trying to move this circle towards the right so that it goes towards my mouse on the side, okay? So there's a, a seam here, basically, a seam on the, on the cylinder where my mouse is, is here on this side, that's great, <laughs> okay? But, and then I can go either way as long as my mouse is here. You see how it follows my mouse this way, follows my mouse that way. And as soon as I go on the other side, it, it's the it's wrong. It's sort of it's trying to follow my mouse. Uh, it's going away from my mouse. Anyway, isn't that fun? And I'm not sure if you could see that in there. I probably could have opened that up a bit for you, couldn't I? Anyway, let's close that. Once true, that's that's been handy <laughs> once or twice. <laughs> uh, that's when we set a style, and instead of applying that style forever we just say please only apply this style once that we're going to set this text to be italic and bold so that's for the congratulations level or label that we don't even see uh, because we're scaling it to zero at the moment but when we finish the thing we have animate we animate in a big congratulations right here so if you want to see what the congratulations look like we won't want to see the button, I guess, uh, but whatever, we'll see the button and then close it. I'm going to run it, and this should bring in the congratulations there. So there's the congratulations, like so. And if this weren't red, then it would look better. <laughs> so why don't we change that back from a red to a black, I think it was, and it's just could be clear as well. And that would allow us to see through it, but... Uh, there's what your congratulations will look like. And we're going to animate that as well. All right, well, we don't even want to see it at the moment. When we animate text, it will animate better if it's cached. In the end, all of this stuff is cached. So everything on the texture active is cached. That's why um, it's not quite, I don't know if you can tell, it's not quite as pixel nice as, as it could be. That's um, definitely a bit, uh, you know, got dithering or aliasing on this edge edges there. You can see these guys look okay. We're zoomed in a bit too. But anyway, it won't matter as much because we're animating that and flashing it. and. Uh, if you animate text, it's usually more efficient to animate a cached version of it. Then it's like it's animating a bitmap, and 
it'll be very smooth and easy for animation, especially if you're animating on mobile. And then if you want, if you're, we never really finish animating. All we do is animate this in and flash it and then we animate it out. So you don't even really get to feast your eyes on it for too long. <laughs> but if you just animate in and then you want it to look nice, then don't bother caching it. Let's just see what it looks like if we can see a difference when it's not cached here. But oh, what I was gonna say is after the animation is done, then you can cache it. Uh, not that much of a difference really that I can see maybe. Um, and that's because these texture actives are all cached. However, what we're doing is we're caching it on the Zim side and then caching it again to um, come in here. We're caching on the Zim side because Zim is handling the animation. So if it has to handle vector animation, that's more calculations as it tries to smoothly animate. Every time it moves, it has to recalculate those vectors. So uh, for the smoothness of animation, we're caching it. It's no big deal. I probably won't even notice it. Uh, like I said, it's usually possibly noticeable on, on mobile, but less noticeable on desktop, if at all. Okay. Let's move along here. These are really some Zim basic things uh, as opposed to anything in particular for the um, for texture actives or the physics stuff, but uh, you know, whatever. These explorers can be about all of this kind of stuff. So we've got a made with, and that is a texture active make backing. What's all this about? A made with is a texture active. And then, all oh, right, there's a backing. Uh, add to make back. Oh, okay. I know. I see what we've done. Uh, this happens to be instead of using a make logo in here, I probably was trying to handle it with a backing. Did I have to? Yeah, there it is. So normally the backing has a message. It looks like this. And I was probably just experimenting with that message. Canvas window right there. And this this we found, we wanted to almost brand it. Uh, it is a texture active and we could have branded it that way. But when we were making these general interfaces with, with Zim inside of 3JS, when you turn it and look at the back of it, what do you have there? And so we tended to use canvas window. And so there it is, like that. Um, do you want to see an example of that? Uh, by the way, if you can't find, this happens to have appeared here, but it's an ad that will, or a promo, that will either be texture active like that, or it could be shaders. So if you come to Zim and you go, I can't find the texture actives, uh, there's a couple ways you can find it. But one way is, this is shaders were new in Zim 016. So if we press that, there's 015 right there. And texture active was new in 015. So that's a nice, easy way to get into it just go find the 015 and here's your texture actives. And there is an example where we have the canvas window on the back. You see, isn't that cool? So, you know, what do you put on the back of it? Oh, there we go, canvas window. So we built that right into texture active as a, hey, if you want a backing, just say, give me a new canvas window. Oh, is that what we called it? I can't remember. Let's have a look. Make backing. Okay, so see how that's right on the texture active class. So it's a static method. It's called texture active dot make backing. And if you don't put anything in there for the uh, for what it says, it will say canvas window. But what we've done, we tried out canvas window and decided that that didn't quite make sense. So we just passed in a quote quote there. In other words, we could have done this if we wanted to with just f dot make logo. So that's another way to make a logo without the word at the bottom, F dot make logo. And then we've added that to the made with, which is this whole thing, which is about that big. It's 400 by 300. So again, if we change the color from black, we'd see what this looks like sitting under there. And then when we tap it, we're going to the Texture Active Studio. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's good. Let's run that again. Did I save it? I think I did. Oh, I didn't. Oh. Oh. So, okay, because that's gone now. Texture Active Studio, by the way, if we come back here, this 
This is the Texture Active Studio. We've inserted this in prominently. We didn't have it when we launched 015, but there it is. And also another way to get there, if we go back to Zim, if we scroll down a bit here, there it is, Studio. All right, so that goes to uh, 35 examples. So this is one example right here, but it's all in this studio of Texture Active work. And so there's the first one. Here's just dragging. And, and this can be done in VR or 3D. And here's dragging on a path. And so if you go in here, you'll go into the studio. So now I'm in the studio. And now I can do a draw. I don't know if you can hear that coming in. We've got some, some music coming in. OK. Um, so that's the Texture Active Studio. Uh, and same with all of these examples. 35 examples, and that's been pretty amazing. So that's where we're linking through to, if you tapped on that. And then we have the cylinder wall. So this is the, the main cylinder here. Good. Texture Active by default have a little corner, rounded corner. You probably wouldn't notice here, so maybe it wouldn't matter, but set the corner to zero. We don't want the content to get in the way of the orbit controls. So the easiest to add a container and set no mouse, we can still track mouse position, the ticker. Uh, okay, so what was all that about? Ah, right. So normally, if this is a, a pane right here, or a panel. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a rectangle. And if I'm not on the content, then I can move things with orbit controls. But you see, if I'm on the content here, I'm on ring maze, I can't move it. So I'm, I'm pressing down right now, and it doesn't move. Whereas if I press down here, it does move. Um, so we could have made it so that I could press down on the ring maze by saying, hey, up on this ring maze here, what's happening is that label is getting in the way of the mouse pressing on the backing of the thing. So we could just say dot no mouse here. And that, that would mean that when I press on the label, it would ignore the, the mouse pressing on the label and end up going through to the backing at which point it would move, uh, as long as the backing has a color. So now if I run this again, uh, now I can press on the maze, which is probably better, because the maze isn't really doing anything. It's not like I gotta click it to go somewhere, as opposed to this one where I click to go somewhere. So that, that would actually be better to put, make that still be able to turn. So all of this is something. And it's on the texture active, and it would get in the way of the mouse. So I would press on here, and I wouldn't be able to spin it. So basically, I could turn this whole maze, no mouse. But if I pressed on this, this little circle, and that little glowing thing, and the start thing, so anything that I pressed on, I'd have to turn no mouse off. So what we're saying is, it would just throw everything into a container, and no mouse the whole container. Then we don't have to individually no mouse each thing. All right. So that's what that's all about. Down here, we're going to make a holder. We're adding it to our wall. And then we just no mouse the whole container. So that means anywhere on this, even if I press on the ball and go, because we're not dragging the ball. If it were a drag the ball thing, then, or if I were pressing on this to make the ball go to wherever I pressed, well, even that we could sort of handle properly. So we're going to make the ball move with um, some other, in some other way, not by dragging it. So I think we'll be OK. And here's the maze. So as it says here, we can load any picture as long as the walls are different than the backing. Um, we could even load two pictures, a hidden one that represents the walls and a visible one that is more complex. So in this case, this is pretty abstract. These walls are just like lines, basically. But if you wanted to, you could remake this. You could remake this by adding 
you know, like a, a rock wall or something like that <laughs> along here, or little vines or something. And then the vines really have nothing to do with the functional maze, but visually they would show different looking walls. Okay, so that's what we mean by two pictures there. And then we're using physics to apply force to the ball to follow the mouse. We're making physics walls dynamically, and these walls are only placed wherever there's a non-background color. So you determine a background color, and then uh, anything that's not the background color is considered a wall. The walls are removed as the balls leave the area, and new ones are made. Because the way we first started this is we just put a wall everywhere there was dark stuff. And the physics just bogged because that's a whole bunch of little physics things that had to do too much calculation. And we scratched our head and went, well, darn, you know, it almost worked, but it was very slow. And it's like, oh, darn, what do we do? Oh, you don't really need those other walls until the ball comes closer. Yay! So that's how we got around that. And like I said, we've had a physics maze for quite a long time. Do you want to see where we have that? So back in Zim under examples. If we search for a maze, maze. Uh, that's an isometric maze. Here it is, hand-drawn maze. There it is, isn't that neat? So there's our ball following along on this hand-drawn maze. It hits those walls. Cool. Huh? And this is from, I don't know, even before it got here, we did it in, back in Zim, straight Zim before we even had CodePen. So I would guess it's probably coming close to eight years, eight years old, something like that. And as mentioned, we went there to make the maze. We made a vertical maze to stop it. Just the way that it was made, it made uh, the maze tool was made, we couldn't seem to make it uh, wide enough or something. I can't remember why. So anyway, we made this vertical one, and then we. Uh, um, exported that as a an image and then just rotated the image so that worked out all right there's the maze we're adding it to the holder and we're caching the maze cache the image so that we have a second canvas to use later that allows us to get the pixel color under the wall without getting the color of the ball that's right okay so um, Let's see, I'm not, I totally, I can't quite remember what that was all about, but there's something to do with if we had the color under the mouse, presumably, pixel, it allows us to get the color of the pixel under the ball without getting the color of the ball. Yeah, um, yeah whatever, okay. Yeah, we got a start and end label that we're putting there. We're making a gradient color that just goes over top of all of it with a blend mode, and that's what makes this uh, gradient color. That adds a lot to it. It doesn't take much to do. People seem to love gradients, and it just uh, makes it a little bit more exciting and helps you keep track of the fact that you're moving this thing around, and we've got the end color and the start color. Nice, huh? All right, and now we're going into the physics side of things. So our physics has no gravity right there. And we've got a ball that is a small purple ball. We've located it at a certain place in the holder. So the holder is the whole container. Basically it's probably the height of the physics wall there, but it just comes to this edge most likely right here like that. So for the maze, we had to add, with Photoshop, we added this entrance way to the maze and the exit way from the maze. That's just how we decided to do it. We probably could have started it in the maze itself, but um, we wanted a division for our mouse. So remember that if our mouse is on this side right here, this ball is going to go that way, to the right. And we wanted a division so that happened less. So that's what we ended up making. Anyway, uh, to locate something right there is we probably use place initially. So if we go dot place in here, usually we leave the dot place around. So that's why I'm not sure we use dot place. But dot place would allow us to pick up the ball and place it and then get the X and Y for the loc 
so place works with loc, doesn't work with pose. Pose is the edge, the edge of the object to the edge of the, so if you pose something at the right, uh, 50, it would be to the right, which would actually be all the way to the end here, <laughs> 50 over to the edge of the ball. Whereas loc locates the registration point of the circle, not the edge of it. Okay, anyway place is handy to give us numbers like that or I could have just put in those numbers and started guessing them and shifting them like oh it's got to be up a little bit more it's got to be down a little bit more and you can do it that way too all right add physics and false means that it's not dynamic so it's our ball is going to start off not dynamic two is we are contracting it by two I think so I think that means, let's see which way is it play, let's have a look. Yeah, you see how the little round, the purple of the ball, mm, you can't really tell all that much there, but it looks like it's hitting two in a little bit. Not sure why I contracted it by two. Otherwise, maybe it looked like it was, I'm not sure. Anyway, that, that would be up to you. And where were we? <clears throat> I decided to add this, this white circle. This thing in behind here and wiggle it. So there's the circle. It's a bigger... Circle's only 8 in radius. This is 30 in radius. Set its alpha down. Centered it on the ball. So it's actually added to the ball, isn't it? Maybe not circle center on the ball yep it is that so that's that's saying put it in the ball or center it in the ball itself and the zero is what at behind the so if it didn't do that it would be on top of the shape inside the ball uh, the circles uh, the ball's a circle which is really a container that has a circular shape in it and so that's why we're allowed to add things or center something on a ball or add to or look inside of a ball uh, like a circle or a rectangle or a triangle etc is because those are shapes or sorry those are containers that have the shape in them but we don't want the uh, the big white circle to go on top of the shape that's in the circle container so that's why we said put it at the bottom there another way would be go dot bot get my fingers going. Okay, dot bot would also put it to the bottom of its container, but may as well just say zero there. And then we're wiggling that by changing the scales with the start scale of uh, one, I guess, and we're wiggling it only by a little bit. So with scale, you got to watch it. Um, two doesn't mean make it twice as big. It means make it twice, make it two, two plus one, the original one. So that's the original. So if we have, this just means uh, it's going to go from 0.9. Oh, um, it will definitely go between 0.9 and 1.1, but sometimes it'll go between 0.8 and 1.2. Okay, so we're plus or minusing this onto the one there. So if we had a one and a two here, it would be scaling it from two to three. Uh, although, like I said, we gotta watch it because that's in the positive. But if we went in the negative, it would be scaling it um, from one to minus one, which is zero basically. And then if we had a two there, that would scale it even more in the minus, like whatever that it would actually flip it. So you just watch it with scales. So you don't want to you don't want to go bigger than that. Uh, if you do want to go bigger somehow, then start off with the bigger number here, and then keep these lower than that number. <laughs> anyway, that's just uh, that's the trickiness of wiggling scale. When you wiggle anything else, it's obvious what you're doing, but wiggling scale is a little bit tricky there. And then these two are the time, so 0.7 seconds to 1.5 seconds. And that's what's giving us this little extra, just a little something extra. Do you want to see what it looks like without that? It's not a big deal, but 
and it's not even a functional thing, really. It's not like, hey, here's the circle. It's got a little bit of that. Now let's hit play here. You kind of can lose it a little bit in a corner if you if you're I don't know I still see it there but it's just not quite as exciting. Okay, so there there are, there we are doing it. The, the extra circle just gives it a bit of <laughs> I don't know dy dynamicism. <laughs> What's the word? <laughs> Makes it more dynamic looking. It seems like something's going on, like it's trying to sense, you know, where it is or something like that. But it's, it's not even, it has nothing really to do with the operation of it. But it does let you visually see what's going on there. Gives it a little bit uh, of an extra thing, all right? And doesn't cost much at all. And then we've got an end, which is a rectangle, the faint coloring. And that basically, that rectangle is right in here. Okay, so there's a, a rectangle with a faint color. I don't know why we need a faint color. Maybe it needs a color to be able to hit, do a hit test on it. If it had, if it were clear, we couldn't do a hit test on it because you can't hit test against a, uh, you can hit test bounds on it though. So I don't know, whatever. Uh, and we are probably going to hit test bounds a bit later, but that's, we've got a rectangle in there that we're gonna do a hit test later. Maybe we did it with contact, and perhaps contact isn't the same as a Zim hit test. So hit tests are what you use in Zim to find out if two things are hitting, but as soon as you use physics, that's not the best way to find out if two things are hitting. It can, can be used, but um, contact is one. If we had, did contact though, then it would hit it. Like if it were a physics object, and we wanted to see if it's contacting it, then it would hit it and bounce, rather than go on top of it. You can't make it go on top of it by using these things called category bits and mask bits. It comes from Box2D, which is our physics engine in the background. So this is using Box2D. How do we tell? Oh, well, Zim's using Box2D. So when we import the Zim physics right here, that also imports Box2D as well, as well as the integrated. Uh, back in Zim 10, we integrated physics right into Zim. Looks like we're hitting the ba so we're not using contact, nor are we setting the category bits and mass bits so that they can overlap. That that allows physics objects to overlap one another without bumping into them. And if you did that, then you can also uh, find out if they are overlapping with this thing called a uh, what do they call that? Uh, let's have a look. In this is Zim Explorer. So going to Zim and Docs and then Physics. Uh, we just added that. I, we always knew it was in Box2D and we used it in the buoyancy thing where we drop mushrooms into a soup and they are mushrooms and carrots and they sort of are buoyant in the soup. Um, not a trigger. Uh, what is it? But anyway, it was always built into Box2D, but we just recently added it into. Uh, our Zim physics as a method here. So I'm just looking through the methods here and we're going to see there's buoyancy, debug update, remove, I don't see it there. I don't think it's on property, so maybe it's a method of the objects themselves. Impulse, force, spin, torque, linear, sleep, wake, follow, control, custom, no control, contact, end, contact. No, it's not there either. So how do we do that again? Contact. Uh, sensor, that's it. So it's a sensor. So let's have a look and see if we see sensor anywhere. Sensor. Sensors. Okay, so it's there, way up there. <coughs> Right, so there it is being added as a sensor. When you add physics, you, uh, as mentioned, we've just added this. So when you add physics to an object, so we added physics to the circle, for instance, um, we can choose whether it's dynamic or not. There's the contracting that we did. So we contracted by two. And anyway, way at the back here, which means we'd probably want to use Zim Duo to get there. Remember Zim Duo? 
uh, had to be, oh, supports duo right here. So basically you would then say squiggly brackets dynamic colon false, sensor colon true. And that would turn it on as a sensor. And let's see what the sensor does right here. Set to true to make the object not interact, but still trigger a contact. Ah, okay, so that, that will then trigger a contact, but the objects won't interact. And that's like um, a hit test for non-interaction. Okay, good. Anyway, we could have used a sensor on that. Uh, in the end, I think it looks like we've just put our own Zim hit test on it. It's a big enough area that the physics isn't gonna make it run all the way through it without it. That's a problem with a Zim hit test. If, if something's moving quickly, it may not register a thin wall. So if, if you had a, a pixel wall, basically, then it, it might pass through it without registering a hit. Whereas contact knows that it can't do that. Contact wouldn't let you do that. It would bounce off that wall and register a hit. I guess that's it. It would bounce off the wall, the edge of the wall, and not even really overlap it. And so it wouldn't register a Zim hit test, but it would register a Box2D contact. Here, we're passing the ball across an expanse, and it's definitely going to, it's not like we're going to physics it so fast that it can't register it. So hit test is fine there. And why do we do that hit test? That's, oh, that's going down a little bit, though. So we, so we I don't know, we scroll down somehow. Uh, well, it's not too far. Here's our end, right. And create a ticker to constantly apply a force to the ball and make the walls near the ball. The factor is for the force. Balance the speed with a tendency to go to, through walls if it's too fast. So if you make it follow too fast, it might not make the walls in time, kind of, and it can, if the ball were smaller, this is a pretty big ball compared to that other small ball that we were doing. And so we did some balancing to make this, this version of the physics is really good. Like it's nice and fast. The other one that I showed you that was from eight years ago or whatever is a little slow because we had problems with it going through walls. So if it were going too fast, it would go through the walls. But in this one, we just balanced it better with um, the size of the ball. Uh, maybe th the issue was with that hand-drawn one that the, the ball couldn't be as big as it is here. Uh, just be aware as well, uh, if you're changing the size of the ball, you're also going to change the size of the force needed to move the ball because the ball has mass and so if you have a bigger ball, you need more force. If you have a smaller ball, that more force would make it go really, really fast. So anyway, it's kind of a balance of how much force we've got going on here. Oh, that's the wrong force. That's a force for an emitter. So it's down here. It looks like we've got some calculations going on. Um, we'll see if we, I haven't reviewed this and it was, it's been like I don't know, three, three months, two months or so, since it, oh, maybe a month since I made this, so apologies. <laughs> it's an exploration for me too. Uh, but we do have an emitter. This is the emitter that's just gonna happen right at the end. I don't know if you remember that. Once it gets to the end, some rings come out. And so the way we did rings is we set, the, it's a circle, but we've set the color of the circle to clear and then the border color is purple and three. So that is making a bunch of rings and we're animating those so that they get either smaller or bigger with a force. The force will say how far from where the, the ring arrives. So the, the ring kind of gets made and then the force is going to try and shoot it from the point that it's made. So they're all getting made at the same point, wherever the emitter is. This is one, one way to do an emitter. We could also make an emitter go all the way across the top or the bottom of something and, and make falling things or go across the sides and make shooting things come across. But um, unless we specify that, the default is from a point, it emits from a point. And so these are emitting these rings. You don't have to animate, but we're just going to make them big. By, by default, they actually shrink. They get smaller and they fade out. So the particles as they emit will start off a certain size and then after a little while get smaller and fade out. That's called shrink and fade. So you can turn those off or here we're overriding it with our own scale decision. 
and a force of two different forces. So this is a zim v value right here, which means we're passing in a parameter. This is a parameter to the, the emitter using um, a zim uh, duo object. So a parameter, uh, or sorry, an object literal that passes the parameter name and value, parameter name and value. We don't have to do it this way in zim. You can just pass in the parameter values without their names. So apparently how or very similar to how Python works, where you can pass in a parameter value equals, or sorry, a parameter name equals a value. You can't do that in JavaScript. In JavaScript, normal JavaScript, you can either pass in a, a object literal here, or you could pass in parameters in order. In Zim, you can do both, and that's because we've set it up. In Zim Duo, we invented that uh, and set it up so that we could pass in either of those. So we are, and then in Zim V, which is the fifth version of Zim, we invented these dynamic parameters, which means that we can pass in an object literal of a min and a max. We can also pass in an array. So if we wanted different gravities, we could go zero, zero comma 10 or something like that, comma 20, and then randomly it would pick the gravity for each particle of any of those and some of them would fall more and some of them wouldn't and if we put minus 10 in there some of them would go up and some anyway uh, we don't want that we're just setting the gravity to zero but that would be another zim v value and you can also have a series of things so we could say a series and have it one two three and what that would mean is first gravity v would be one the next one would be through two then the next one would be three then we go back to one back to two back to three there's different ways that we can do. We can bounce this. I think it's bounce we use here, uh, whatever. And that would go one, two, three, three, two, one. And there's also a way to go one, two, three, two, one, etc. cetera. But, uh, so we've got different methods you can throw on the different end there. Anyway, all that's very powerful. That all works with style as well, which makes uh, Zim very powerful in that regard. So here we don't want that. We just want a gravity of zero. And this is, uh, this is just on the emitter, okay. So that's gonna emit some rings eventually. Did we start paused? And we start pause, so otherwise that would be going. So let's see what that looks like going. Run. And, and there it is, we haven't positioned it, so it looks like it's right after the plate, or it's at zero, zero. Okay, so it's sitting at zero, zero, and it, half of it's going up and half of it's going to the left of what we see there. So this is because we've just added it to the holder. So um, we could dot move it, relative movement of 200 comma 200, and we'd see that a little bit better. Woo! Okay, as opposed to our default gravity of 10, which or we could take away gravity there, and then we get stuff falling. Okay. And normally if we, we took away all of that, then this is what our rings would be looking like. Pow! <laughs> okay, sorry, we didn't want that. Seems a little bit too forceful. Might be because the ball is small. I think our force also relates to how big the object is that we're emitting. Uh, we could check that out times um, 4.5. I don't know, maybe maybe not. I can't remember if we care how big things are. Certainly going quite fast and falling. Anyway, whatever. <clears throat> All right, we don't want a series. Uh, gravity zero, I think we're good. And we have start, pause, true, so we won't even see it. to concentrate when that's shooting away there. So a factor of 0 0.05, this is the force. Force is incremental in time, so make it small. Max, limit the mouse distance, which limits the force. Oh, okay, in physics, there's two, uh, two ways to move something with a force. There's impulse and there's force. Impulse is a one-time deal, you just, just happens once. So usually that's bigger. It's like hitting a pool ball, Bah! Whereas force is over time, like gravity. So it constantly acts on it and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. 
Um, so we want, if we're using force to follow the, the, the cursor, then we don't want to put a lot of force on that because over time it heads towards the cursor and it will build in speed. Limit the mouse distance, so that has something to do with the mouse di distance, which is going to end up limiting your force. And we're calling a function make walls. Constantly we're making walls. So now we're in a ticker. A ticker happens over and over again. Ooh, got an old function in there. <laughs> right, because remember this came from seven years ago before we were using arrow functions. Anyway, I tried to... Oh, and we've got bars. <laughs> Oh, and another bar there, a couple bars. We tried to um, adjust these, although that actually, probably both those could be constants. Well, let's see if there still runs here. Yeah. Sure, it does. Okay. All right, so we're calling make walls all the time, and we're also figuring out how far and constraining to the max. Uh, is that the max that we set up? Yeah, here. All right. So we're making sure that the distance, so this is the distance between the mouse, that's how we can get the mouse in Zim, and the ball's current x. And we're multiplying that by a force. So if we're far away, we're trying to make more force. If we're closer, make less force. And that way, it acts a bit naturally. All right. Uh, but we're not just, like we could put that in there, but we'd run into problems. First of all, it might be too small and therefore our fa or too big, it would be well too big, I guess, because our factor is dividing that greatly. Uh, and we might not be within a min and a max. So constrain is a Zim function, which will take this value and make sure that it doesn't go smaller than that or bigger than that. It's the same as going math.max, math.min are like within each other. You go math.max between the negative and whatever its value, uh, but the value is actually math.min of the positive and its value, and you have to throw that all together. That's the same as constraint. So this makes, a little, makes it a little bit easier. So that's what our difference in the x and our difference in the y is. And then we're saying, yes, let's make that the force. I don't even think we have to do this anymore. We, we already did this in Zim. So this is older. Uh, Zim now has a follow on the ball. We could have just used that probably. So if we take a look at the docs here again. Uh, those are examples. Buoyancy attach break debug. This, in, in physics, uh, the docs for physics is a little more complex because you've got the docs right in the same one. You've got docs for uh, the physics itself, physics class, physics object, and you've got the methods and stuff that you can add for the objects themselves. So this is the, when you do an add physics, here's what those things mean, and one of them somewhere as a follow. There's impulse and force and the difference between those two. Then spin and torque, so that's the same but for rotation. And here's follow right here. So this follow allows you to... Oh no, that's not it. So follow will move the whole the whole physics world basically to follow a physics object. If the physics world is bigger than your stage, then it will follow it. So that's not what we were talking about. Control, this is it right here. So type speed x and speed y, control the objects with arrows. Oh, that's for arrows, so that's not it. Maybe we don't have one that is mouse controlled. Okay, I guess not. So we've got control, oh well, what's the type? Default both, WASD and arrows. Okay, so we've got uh, following things around with mouse, or sorry, keyboard, but if we want to follow with a force, that's what our motion controller does, but the motion controller works on physics object, or sorry, Zim objects, not physics objects. Unless we have the motion controller, let's just check to see, maybe we built that into the motion controller. Uh, oh, that's wrong, search, motion. Cam motion, motion controller type. 
No smooth press move. Yeah, so nothing relating to physics itself. So I think we're we're good doing it this way. There's not much. There it is. Okay. And now your your for a force is being applied towards your cursor. Okay, just those. That does it. And if we're hitting the end, then we're going to spurt, or we locate the emitter at the ball, and we spurt 20 times. So that's how you run the emitter, spurt. We're just checking on our time over here, so we're about an hour. That's okay for a Zim Explorer. Um, sometimes the explorers go on for an hour and a half. You're always welcome to pause right now, get a cookie, or have some ice cream, and have a blueberry sauce on it or something, you know, and uh, you'd be happy. <laughs> Come on back and get a bit more of this. So this is if we're hitting at the end there. Uh, we're setting the dynamic to false, so the ball will no longer move. At some point, we're going to see how we set the dynamic to true, but it looks like we've done this before we've hit the button. Well, no, we saw the button, didn't we? So where was the button? I can't remember. Uh, I thought the button was up above somewhere. Uh, okay. And we're hiding the ball and we're locating the body. Yeah. If you want to move a physics object, you're not really supposed to move physics objects like an act of God and place it at X and Y of 100, 100. Okay. You're supposed to let forces move the move the physics objects. Otherwise you get things like, I don't know, moving through walls and stuff that you're not really supposed to do. But we did provide a way to handle it, a, a loc on the body. So rather than ball.x and y, which ball is the zim object, you don't just set its x and y because it's gonna get overwritten by the physics engine. It's gonna change that right away. But we can tell the body to be located, and this goes right into box 2D, well, almost right in it. It goes into our Zim 10 physics, no, before Zim 10 physics, it goes into just our physics uh, helper module, and right from the beginning, and will be an act of God. So we're basically putting the ball back at the starting part. We are animating in the wind message. Uh, we're waiting a little bit to do that because we want to see the emitter go a bit before we bring in the congratulations. So the emitter is going. This is what's happening. The emitter's um, emitting. And then we wait a little bit and then we're animating in and rewinding so it goes out and we're using with elastic out. So um, it kind of comes in, it elastics a bit and then goes out. That's basically what's happening. Okay, from a scale of zero, that message was scaled at zero, and we animate to a scale of one. Nice. And then after a certain amount of time, we're turning the dynamic back to true. We're setting the balls visible true, and we're, oh, spurting the ball, or spurting the emitter on this side. And so that it kind of like is a portal. We, you know, brrr, it just ended from here, brrr, it arrives over here. Okay, so that's what happens when we win. And also by removing that ball, that means the hit test will no longer be hitting because you don't want this to happen more than once, all of this stuff. So just be careful with hit tests. And we have a bunch of tips with hit tests. You can find them at Zim, in the gold bars, under tips, and hit tests. find it already. Hit test there. So there's hit tests. So talking about when you test for hitting, we're in a ticker so we're good we're testing constantly for hitting. Or in a press move or press up, throwing something in the garbage. Um, too many hits. So hitting too many times. If we didn't remove the ball, as the ball moved into that rectangle, it would hit, 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 hit. And each time we would be um, spurting the emitter. Spurt, 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 spurt. And we'd run into some problems. And if we were playing a sound, it would be sound, like that. So uh, you want to make sure that you either remove the object so that it's no longer hitting. And that's kind of what we've done. We've taken it away. 
or remove the ticker that's doing the hit test or removing the mouse event, etc. All right, or doing a hit check, like so you could set it to false and then when we hit, you set it to true. See how we set it to true in there? Then it's only gonna do it once. So if it's not already hit check, then it's not gonna do this. Um, or sorry, if it's not hit check, then it will do it. But if we set it to true, then it will no longer play the sound. So that those are some ways that you can avoid that issue. And multiple objects. If you're wanting, if you've got lots of monsters and you just hit a monster, you, you need to loop through those monsters to find out if you're hitting any of them. You need to loop backwards. So that's basically saying right in here in the loop, um, loop backwards right here, true. Okay, so that, that's in a zim loop right there, says loop backwards, because if you remove an object and you're looping through a container of those objects and you've moved one, if you're going forward, you end up messing up the index and you can skip ones or cause, cause uh, the index to be undefined because you no longer had that many in it. So, okay, loop backwards is your technique there. So those are the tips for hit tests. There's also different types of hit tests as well, and we're just using hit test bounds there, but there's all sorts of uh, different ones that you can use. All right, great. Next, how do we make these walls? Mm, we're calling make walls. Ah, oh, that's, that's outside this, and all this is right in the ticker, make walls. So here we are preparing for the walls. So this is not in the ticker anymore. We're going to get the canvas of the maze. So we, we brought in the maze picture, we cached it, and now we're getting the cache canvas, which gives us access to the canvas. And this is the context. Uh, so sorry about that. Why do we bother doing that? This this is old. We have a way of getting right on the bitmap. We can get this thing right here. That's what we're looking for. Get image data, and that's on the context. Add an x and y of one pixel. Uh, will give us the data, and then we're analyzing the data to find out if there's something there. Is basically what we're doing. The data is zero and y at zero. I don't know. That's the alpha. That no, that's not the alpha. That's like one of the colors, I guess. Not sure what the data is. Get image data. Uh, we'll probably say it in all of this stuff. I don't know how much I want to go into this. <laughs> you imagine? He's like, but but wait, 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 that's why we're listening to this explorer. We want to see how you're hitting the wall. That's the only thing we want. Here I am going. Oh, we're not going to look at this. We're just going to like go over it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the the only reason why I was sort of jumping about here is that we actually have in the if we go into the bitmap zim and go into the docs and hit bitmap mind you this is not a bitmap at the moment so we have to pass it in we just pass in our picture of them we pass in our picture of the maze into the bitmap and once we do that we have uh this same kind of thing i guess we're doing here so this is an example of that's filling a bitmap with noise no it's uh have one. Oh yeah, right there. So if we've got a bitmap, oh, we're still doing crap like that to get that. Okay, so it looks like we're still accessing the context 2D of our bitmap and doing the get image data. And then we're getting a color based on that. So yeah, that the data is RGBA, I think, RGB alpha. And that's joining it to find out what the RGBA is. So maybe we were just finding the first one. Do, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. RGB, if we've got white and we've got black, then uh, we're just checking the very first one uh, of RGB, the red content of it. And if there's something there, then it's white. And if there's nothing there, then it's black. So that's how we're testing the pixel. Anyway, I thought that we had put a method in here. Maybe we did. Let's just see. Get color at. Returns the RG. Okay. <laughs> so I don't think we, even in this example, so this is an old example, we added the 
uh, get color at when we went to handle all of our keying out. So we, we did a bunch of work with um, the cam uh, so that we could key out background colors of pictures and stuff like that. And when we did, we added this method right here, get color at. Uh, and that means we don't even need to do all this. We could have just said bitmap, I probably not even cached it, and said, Get what, what color is that it? And it does all, it would have done all of that for us without having to do it. So um, let's see. What I would need to do here then is go into to interaction.html, probably this one, and under. Flipper socket requests. Crap, where is it? Index devs. Sorry, I didn't realize that. And there it is. Updates HTML. Updates.txt. Uh, this is for the docs. Kids editor. Marketing. Do I have anything for the docs? Thought I did. Somewhere. <laughs> okay, this is an exploration of how I work. Site. Code, okay, we'll call it under the code, but maybe I can just say docs here. I thought I had something like that. And what is it? Um, update bitmap uh, get color at pixel example with method. Okay, so if I don't do that, we might have forgotten to update that. And these are basically notes we've got for the upcoming. As in, oh, cheat, cheat, cheat. You could slow this. Oh, no, there's the secret secret ingredient. Close. Eh. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, so if you if you made it this far, you got a little hint at what might be coming out in Zim 017. But, of course, if I didn't even mention that, then you wouldn't have, <laughs> you wouldn't have even seen the hint or even known about it. Uh, no big deal. Slight spoiler. All right, closing this down. So there is an easier way for us now to do this, but it's basically uh, what we're wanting to do is we loop through num. We, we can't loop through everything. So we made a little mini grid, surely. So we're not wanting to loop everywhere to find out. Or maybe we do, uh, maybe we loop everywhere and find out if it's close to the ball. But basically we want to loop only around the ball. So how did we, how do we do that? Make walls. Loop walls function. What are walls? Remove any walls from the last time. Hmm. Okay, so if we have presumably a container of walls, or maybe it's an array of walls. Yeah, walls is an array. And we want to get the wall, which we can do like that now. Uh, we're going to remove from the physics the wall. So this is getting rid of the walls and then resetting the walls array to empty. Loop through our grid. I and J. Okay, num and num. So what what is num then? Num is 20. Test a 10 by 10 grid around the ball. <clears throat> okay, so we are not testing everywhere. We're only testing 20 pixels. 10 on the left, 10 on the right, 10 above, 10 down below. And you can adjust that as you need. The more there are there, the slower it's going to be. Um, okay, so we're doing a double loop with I's and J's. <clears throat> That's a Zim loop. And inside, we're locating the X and Y point. Mm, we have a spacing that we're using. So what do we do for the space? Just a space of one on the grid. And I think you'll find that that basically makes finds out the X and Y to the left and right of the ball. And these things can be cons probably, although often if I'm remaking them in a loop, I'll make them let's, but they const is fine because it's constant within this inner loop. Uh, and that can also be const. So there we are, we're getting the color. And if, there, if there's not much black basically. No, black is zero. Well, 
make wall if color is darker than the background color? Hmm. Yeah, zero. Okay, right. So if the data is closer to zero, if it's black, it's zero, then that's going to be less than 150, and we're going to make a wall there. And we're going to make the, uh, just a physics circle as big as we want, uh, or specified there, right there. Just a one pixel radius, a little one pixel wall. And make that dynamic. Okay, you may not have seen this. This makes a, this is what um, the Zim physics helper module uses to make a circle. Initially, when we first in integrated, or not integrated physics, but when we had the physics helper module for box 2D, we would then map the Zim object to the circle physics object using a map command or something like that. And that would then mean that the physics object or the Zim object would move to the physics object. Yay. <clears throat> but that was an extra step to map that. In Zim 10, we said, all right, let's do that automatically with an add physics method. So as soon as we use circle.addPhysics, we'll map for you so that you don't have to make a physics circle and then map your Zim object to that. And that's what we meant by integrated physics. That's why we can just say new circle dot center dot add physics and physics gets mapped. So we no longer have to do this. Anyway, we don't have a physics object. Like we don't have a Zim object. We have only the physics object. So we're little walls. We, we don't see any little walls. So all we're wanting to make are little physics walls, not uh, a visual display of those physics walls. So here we are going back to sort of the an older method of actually saying, give me a physics circle. Okay, and that is of that radius and it's static, so it doesn't move. We're then setting the X and Y of that physics object. Now we could do that with loc these days. So we could say wall.loc and X, comma X and Y. So change that, let's see if it works, dot loc. Uh, x comma y. So this is loc on the physics body because that's what we got here, a physics body, not a zim. It's not the zim loc. It's a, well, it's not the same as a zim loc, but we decided to move loc into the physics as well just so we can be a bit consistent on how we call that. Yeah, let's see if this works still. Play. Boink, a boink, a boink. So those walls definitely are still being loped there. If they weren't being loped there, this is what we get. Play. Oh, what an easy maze this is. Ah, wee. Okay, so we have not made any physics walls. And make it to the end. Congratulations. And then in comes that. Okay. So uh, we want to loke. And we're pushing this wall that we've made. We then push it into walls. So it's added to our array. Great. That means that as we go around, those physics walls are made. And we don't have to find out if anything bumps into them because that's what the physics engine does. All of a sudden, we've got this dynamic circle that's moving. And it hits these little static walls. I wonder if I can turn the debug on. And no, I don't think so. Debug and the texture actives don't really map properly. I'm pretty sure we can try it, but I don't think it works. Because um, the debug is an overlay of another canvas, and I don't think we've mapped that in physics. But you can try it on the other example, physics.debug. something there. Play. No, it might be a layering issue because, oh, I see something. Yeah, look, there's a little something. But it's, th so those are the little walls being made. It's just they're not being made in the right place. 
normally if, if we were to make this, it, it would be uh, right on top of what we're looking at here. Okay, interesting. And there's those little walls being made that's sort of blocking. Isn't that cute? <laughs> uh, it's really, really small too. I don't know why it's like hooked up to the left, but it's much smaller than the original. Anyway, like I said, we didn't map up the debug when it came to the texture actives. That's probably what's happening. This is the stage right here. Yeah, I guess that's it. So this, you see this box right here is at zero, zero on our screen. So it has no idea where to go. It's not scaled and fit in the, in the texture. It's actually just drawn uh, independent of 3JS, which is what, how all the rest of the stuff, see it's not even moving with it. It's, there it is right there. Okay, so not hooked up. All right, and I'll save that and let's run it again. How are you guys doing? Um, sometimes if I don't talk to you, I just sort of keep on bumbling along, going blah, 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 here's this, that, and the other thing. Maybe it's not quite as engaging for you. Uh, and if you are still here, uh, here I am talking to you. I'm glad you're here. You're always welcome to come into zimjs.com slash forum or forum.zimjs.com. Uh, it used to be just, I would say, zimjs.com slash slack, zimjs.com slash discord. But we've moved Slack. We no longer do Slack. We've moved that to forum. So it could be zimjs.com slash forum or zimjs.com slash discord. But we also call it forum.zimjs.com. <laughs> okay, so you can get there either, either way. The forum is the best place to come and visit us. You can ask any questions there, get involved in Zim, see examples that we've been doing, etc. So it's all free and easy. We'd love to see you there. Don't be shy. Like I said, especially if you've listened this long, surely you have some interest. And we'd love to connect with you. All right, coming back down then. Great, we just made the walls. Super. Now we're on to our 3JS stuff. So we're starting, we're using the Zim helper module. Uh, this is also available at Zim.3 right here. So this is from our physics helper, or no, sorry, from our 3JS helper module. Whereas this physics right here, did you really need to see it? This physics is from our physics helper module. Okay, so that's why we had to import right up at the top three for our 3JS stuff and physics. Otherwise, normally when we import Zim, it's just like that, we would only have one. Okay, but we need both of these in this case. So coming back down to our 3JS stuff, we've already made some texture actives above. Recall those. We'll just a quick review of the texture actives or texture active singular there's one right there that's our wall we also have another couple that aren't really all that important there are made with which is down here the zim icon and we have a message which is up here the, the logo in the play thing I don't know why we call it a message or whatever okay and that's our logo and our button so we have these three texture active singular objects, texture active. And now we're going down into 3JS. This you'll find pretty simple. Um, we uh, don't really need that. I can just use width and height here, I believe. Oh, maybe not, no, huh? No, um, yeah, okay, so I'll leave it as it is. Okay, right, so that's this size, whatever the window size is. Uh, we have brought the camera to a certain location. This is in the X, this is in the Y, so back a little bit, or up out of the screen, and then up higher, uh, up above a little bit. And oh, I mean, those are the settings that I use for VR, but in this case we don't care about that. I just happen to we everything else is sort of scaled to match that. 3JS is sort of scaleless. You can make everything really huge or really small, but you just have to make sure that you make everything <laughs> related to you know how, how big or how far away you are. Otherwise, you end up if you make something really big, you're going to start off being inside that something. You might not be able to see anything. So you just have to watch you know where your camera is versus how big you've made your objects. Okay, and we're setting texture active true. Okay, so we all want to set that to true so that we can use the texture active system. This sets this sort of saved, I don't know, 10, 
10 lines of code in your in 3js so it's just a one call rather than setting up each of these things as you would in 3js we have some examples in the texture active area where we uh, do it raw so we're using zim texture actives without even using the three helper module for those of you who really want to keep on doing all those other 10 lines or if you have more control or whatever of 3js so you already know how to do all those other lines and just want to keep on doing them then we have raw examples uh, but hopefully you'll see that we can actually there's a few things that this makes it just easier that's why i call it a helper module here we are gaining access to the things that the helper modules make if we need them sometimes we don't where we're going to access the render that that made the scene the camera the canvas and we're setting up some controls if we want orbit controls they need to know the camera and the canvas and so sometimes we just stick this is the three object the helper object that we made we might just stick three dot camera right here and three dot canvas right here and not even bother with this but whatever okay so those are our orbit controls we're also making it so that we can kind of throw the orbit controls a little bit and that's uh, compared to when we don't throw it so here's what that looks like Now I'm not throwing it, it's, it's more like directly attached. And it looks like I inverted <coughs> something. Yeah, so I found that this is normal orbit controls and I don't find that this is intuitive. Usually I, I find orbit controls quite intuitive, but for some reason when we're inside a cylinder, <laughs> it just feels like I'm trying to go the wrong way. I, I, I feel like I'm trying to drag this and as I drag it, it goes the opposite way. That seems odd to me. So that's what this rotate speed does. Let's just see if we adjust the rotate speed. Okay, see how I put ne times negative five and that just makes it rotate the opposite way. And then this is for the damping, but with the damping, you've got to add things to your pre-render to update the controls. So that's all of this stuff will handle the damping in orbit controls. And if we run it, and also switching the different direction, isn't that nice? Is that nice that? Oh, slides like that. Okay, and now to the texture actives. So here, a new texture actives, plural. So we've made a wall, a message, and a made width texture active objects. If we only had one texture active, you could just put it in there, not in an array if you wanted to. Or if you really wanted to, you could put it in an array, but we've got three of them. So we are going to put them in an array. Here's access to the three, this is the three JS um, namespace. There's our three helper module reference, the render, the scene, the camera, and the control. So all of those things get passed in to our texture actives. There can actually be some more parameters in there as well that will make it so that it ray casts only uh, on certain layers. So that can be handy. If you have a bunch of other 3JS stuff that isn't using Texture Active, then you'll want to look into that. Uh, you can say the layer that our, our interface or whatever our Texture Actives will be on. And that way, as it ray casts all of the objects, it will only ray cast the objects within the, the layer that you've specified when looking for texture actives and it makes it more performant. Okay, so we have examples of that back in the texture actives places. And note that physics needs to be first, so it says it's zero, zero. That's, that's been a, a little bit tricky for us all along. Uh, our physics world always needs to be at zero, zero on the stage, otherwise it all messes up and uh, we tried fixing that up a bit, but it's just not worth it. So that's the deal. That's not as easy as you might imagine. Otherwise, we would have done it. We've done all sorts of things that are very hard. <laughs> Zim, uh, many of the things. This texture active stuff was extremely hard to do and tricky. And so trust me, when it comes to moving a physics world, I, it's just not, not easy. <laughs> All right, um, we don't have a T key. I think it's probably because uh, we haven't set it up so that we've pressed on the actual frame of this. So that's a tricky thing with iframes. If you want 
keyboard control, we have a way of uh, dealing with that normally with a, a start pane and we kind of, we trick it. We don't turn on any uh, mouse events on the canvas. We let it go right on through to the iframe. And as soon as it gets to the iframe, then we turn on the keyboard access or the mouse events on the, on the canvas. And that allows uh, keyboards through iframes. Um, anyway, uh, but we haven't done that here, so that's probably why we're having a toggle problem. And if the object is a pane, then we can use make panel. So it was quite, um, quite common as we're building here in Texture Active. So there's shaders. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is hit there and then press 015. When we're making all of these things, many of them, look, there's a panel, this is the panel. That's not, that's a box. These little things on the edges are panels. This is a panel because it's, even though it looks like it's, uh, even though it looks like it's a model, it's actually just a flat plane, a panel basically, uh, sitting on top of that model, all right? So, uh, it's very common to just be able to use a plane if you want. In some cases, there's other other cases like here we're putting things on boxes. There we've got things on cylinders. So there are other cases where we're we're not using panels, but in general, and most of these things are on panels. Like see a flat panel right there. So when you're using a panel, uh, close that we have provided a helper right here called make panel, 3.make panel. And what that really does is in the background, it makes a 3JS plane. And we've got it so that we can also curve that nice and easily. Isn't that cool? And we can scale it. Basically, when we make this panel, we say, what is the texture active that's gonna be the uh, material for this panel or the texture for this panel? And what are, which texture actives are we wanting to add this to? So that's this object right here. And that simplifies that. We then add the canvas window and we're positioning it. And that is this guy, I guess, probably. It's called a canvas window. Three dot make panel canvas window message. Oh, no, nope, that's the top one message right there. Here's another one. Same deal. Oh, nope, this is the cylinder. Where's the other one? Here's the last one, make panel. This time it's the made width, which is down here. And we've added a bit of a curve to that. We scene.add zim link, okay, because that's what the panel's called, and we positioned it. So great, we just added two texture active panels. That's all it took to make one. And here's what it took to make another, okay? Adding it to the scene, positioning it, and making the panel itself. Okay, saying what texture active goes in it, and which texture actives object it's using. And that's it, isn't that cool? So we just made two panels. Now we're making the cylinder. So here it's a little bit different in that we're making the, we're doing the 3JS. So here we are adding a 3JS cylinder geometry, a 3JS canvas texture right there, etc. So when we made the panel, that happens, but it, it's all done right in here for us. So we don't have to make those 3JS stuff. It was done for us. So this is what has to happen when we have to do it or manually ourselves. So we make the geometry, just like you guys who work in 3JS, very used to making geometries. We make a texture. It's a canvas texture. And we want the walls canvas, not just the wall. Okay, that's the texture active object but it's not a canvas, it's a Zim texture active object. So if we want the canvas of that texture op active object, then you put the canvas property of the wall. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward as well. And then for the material, this is usually straightforward. It's just in this case, a cylinder has a top and a bottom and around the cylinder, the edge of the cylinder, whatever. Okay, top and bottom. This is a cylinder, like a tube, <laughs> okay? Uh, and if we're inside it, we actually want to um, flip the material. So we want the three backside. 
because we're inside the object. So the back side rather than the front side. Otherwise, our maze would be on the outside of the cylinder. That's the default. Um, we're also flipping the material. So this is a, a Zim helper module because uh, otherwise it's reversed on the inside. And that just sometimes things get reversed on the back. For instance, if you have a cube, five of the sides look good. One side, the back side, is flipped. You know, so if you had some text, a label, on five of the sides, you would see the label the right way. And on the back side, it would be backwards. <laughs> that's like, ah, that's a 3JS thing. It probably makes sense in the 3D world somehow. So we made this flip material, which allows you to flip that um, pretty easily. Okay, so that's just throwing a flip material in front of that. And that will, and you can choose your own material, whatever you want here. Okay, uh, there's a lot of easier examples of how to apply a material, like one line example uh, in the texture active things. But this, this happens to be, we want the texture only on one of the sides of the cylinder and we want it on the inside and we want it to be flipped. <laughs> so that adds a, a little bit of complexity here. The other two, we're just making transparent so that we don't see them. Okay, otherwise we would see them there. If I take these away. I'm not sure. They might be black and maybe we won't see them. Can't remember. Uh, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so there's there's a problem. I'm there, that's the top of it. You see that? It's white. And this is the bottom of it. So that's what the top and the bottom of our you can only see them from the outside. When you're inside, you can't see them. When you're outside you can see them if we zoom back around there it is so we don't want that to happen i guess our cylinder is a little bit taller than i am remembered it being whatever um so undo that and make those transparent so we don't see them mm, and here's the next step then to mesh, this is a 3JS step, to mesh the geometry with the material, and that gives us our mesh. That's what we see. We're adding that and rotating it around, otherwise I think the seam's in the wrong place. And we're adding that to the seam, so we're adding our cylinder mesh to the seam. And then we have one final texture active step to do, and that is we have to tell texture actives to add the mesh, this mesh to it. And that hooks it up. So if you're using raw texture active, you basically do the geometry and the texture using the texture actives canvas. You make the material and that material just um, is going to use that texture. And then you mesh the material and the geometry. You add it to the scene and then you have to add the mesh to the texture actives. So all of those steps are done for us in here, well, aside from the adding to the scene, okay, when we do a panel. And there's lots of examples of us adding texture actives to cubes and other things, so you're welcome to look at those other examples. Yay! And what have we got down here? Three, oh, we've done that already. A throttle test. This is the last thing it looks like, aside from all the docks. And that is on some older mobiles. We are constantly updating the cache, so when we want to put something on the material, we need to, 3JS needs that to be constantly updated. So we're constantly remake, redoing the cache of any of our objects. And that can be a little slow on mobile sometimes at 60 frames per second. So what we're doing is we're adding a ticker that's going to store the frames per second in there. And if the frames Hmm, that's a little odd because this frame per second that we're testing will only be at the two seconds. It's probably what it would have been better is if we added up how the frames per second, how many times we tested and then did a division or something. But anyway, it looks like we're testing after two seconds, 
if the frame per second that we got is less than 50, then we're setting the frames per second to 30 and we're removing this ticker. Hmm, just a sec. We, yeah, okay, there's the end of the condition. No, where is it? If, yeah, that's the end of the conditional. We always, regardless of whether it's less than, we always remove this because we don't want to keep on testing, testing, testing. Okay, so that's just a throttle test. You don't have to have that if you don't want to. Wow, Zim Explore! Isn't that amazing? And if we refresh here, run this one more time without that white stuff, top and bottoms. Now you can see that we're, we can see right through there, top and bottom. Cool, huh? Whoa. All right. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. This has been a Zim Explore. I am Dr. Abstract. Hopefully uh, that was enjoyable for you. Uh, if you want to ask any questions about it, like I said, you're welcome to come to forum.zimjs.com or uh, zimjs.com slash discord and say hi. Have fun playing the maze. I think it's absolutely wonderful that we can make a hand-drawn maze even and actually play it. And so you saw some of the techniques to do that back in the physics. And we also saw how to integrate it even into 3D like this. And hopefully this also shows some of the, uh, the strength of Texture Active. Like that's, that's quite exciting as far as I'm concerned. Take it easy. Have a great day or night. Cheers.